Now, it's true, our gospel account here today of the widow trying to get her fair treatment from the unjust judge, it shows us how we are to persevere in our prayer, but not out of desperation, out of confidence. We are to pray constantly, continually, but confidently, because, like our Lord pointed out, if an unjust judge will finally give a sentence, a good sentence, to a poor, needy widow, because of her persistence? How much more will our loving Father in heaven give us the things that we need? So pray always, but pray confidently. There's a lot more going on here than this, especially when we connect the gospel with our first reading from the book of Exodus. Prayer is part, a huge part, of spiritual warfare. Now, usually when you think about the giants of the spiritual life, those whom we think about first, we think about those who are outstanding in prayer, like the Blessed Virgin Mary, or St. Joseph, or St. Francis, or St. Mother Teresa, countless others. We see sanctity, right? We see their holiness. We should also see them as warriors. Yes, us Catholics, we're people of peace because we follow the Prince of Peace, our Lord Jesus. And yes, we work to help those who are poor. We help to those who are in any kind of struggle or fighting some kind of darkness, especially spiritual darkness, because we have the light of Christ. But Lord Jesus, he had to conquer sin and death. He had to give his life to do so. And so we might now be able to live. And just because Jesus has risen from the dead, one thing has not changed. We're still at war. The devil will not stop at anything to get you, your family, your friends, to give up on the Lord in order for them to lose heaven. There's a war going on for your soul and for the souls of others. So we have to be able to fight, and prayer can be our main weapon. So let's set all this up. How is all this connected here? As we see from our first reading, when the Israelites were able to be set free, from slavery to the Egyptians because of God's hand through all the plagues, especially, the, of course, the, the Passover. They crossed the Red Sea, right? But they entered into what is now the Sinai Peninsula. Amalek was a nation of fierce, mean-spirited nomads who controlled that part of the world. And they were not happy at all that the Israelites were moving through their territory. So they would send raiders to go and kill them. What they would do would be come behind the Israelites as they were moving along and pick off the ones who were slow or lag behind, the elderly, the sick, the children, and they would kill them. You could say that the Amalekites were an ancient version of what we face today, based upon what St. John Paul II told us, the culture of death. As for us too, oftentimes the elderly, the sick, children, are put to death, oftentimes out of convenience. But as the Israelites made their way to Mount Sinai, they were attacked head on by the army of the Amalekites, and they were forced to respond. They had no choice. Now keep in mind, the Israelites, they were not a nation of warriors, like for example, the ancient Spartans. They've been slaves all those years, all those centuries to the Egyptians. They were not a nation of soldiers. So things did not look good for them there's a possibility that the entire nation would be wiped out. But what do we see? The courageous young man, Joshua, go out and lead the Israelites with whatever weapons they could find, while Moses went up to the mountaintop to seek God in prayer. What was Moses asking God for? The ability to fight and to be victorious. Because sometimes there is no other alternative. So here's something we have to keep in mind. The people fight and pray, which means that prayer and action are together. Both are necessary. Both have to work together. Well, it should be the same way with us. Our prayers should make us very effective in our actions. In our actions, it should reflect the fruit of our prayers, especially when it comes to fighting for the souls of our loved ones. There's something else we have to keep in mind as well, because the same sort of battlefield is lining up for us here in our day. The theologian John Bergsma, he points out, in the Old Testament, 
There is no such thing as a secular war. Nobody went to war for whatever secular reasons. Every battle was both a physical but also a spiritual conflict because the opposing armies would call upon who? Their gods to fight against the gods of the other people. See the way the people saw it back then? The battles between nations were also battles between gods, their divinities, and the stronger gods would win in their way of looking at it. But we see the same thing in Exodus. In fact, it's even the same thing for us here today. For Moses and Joshua and the Israelites, there was a spiritual battle going on between the Lord God of Israel and the gods of the Amalekites. Now God, the true God, had just crushed the gods of the Egyptians, with the 10 plagues, defeating the God of the Nile, the God of the crops, the God of livestock, the sun God, all those were defeated. And for us, we're living in an age that's less and less Christian. You guys know that, right? Less and less Christianity is all around us now. More and more paganism, with all kinds of false gods popping back up into the picture, including, of course, a new god, the god of technology. And don't you think for one second that people don't worship that. So for us, as it was for the ancient Israelites, in any spiritual battle, for our souls, for our family, for our country, for our church, prayer is vital. In fact, how important is prayer? God himself, as we see in our readings, chooses prayer as his way to give us victory. So it was Pope Benedict XVI who pointed out that Moses, up there in the mountain, with both of his arms lifted up in prayer, strikes a pose very similar to, of course, Jesus Christ, as the Lord did upon the cross. Of course, remember, Moses' arms were up. They would win the battle. He got tired, put his arms down, or lose the battle. He had to keep his arms up. So we see Moses as a type of Christ, a foreshadowing of the great prayer of Jesus to the Father that was his passion and crucifixion. The great prayer that defeated the enemy, our enemy, the devil, forever. The great thing is, as Catholics, we participate in that great prayer of Jesus on the cross every single time you come to Mass. But now it does have to be said, some people are surprised to hear that the life of a Christian is a life of battle. In fact, you know, some adults who go through RCIA, who convert to the Catholic faith, sometimes they think that once they're baptized, things become much, much easier to manage. On one hand, that is true. Things will become easier to manage because you will have the fullness of the Holy Spirit to give you the grace and the encouragement to receive and to keep our lives in order. But on the other hand, once all of us become fully Catholic, well then guess what's waiting for you? Struggles, battles, war. You don't believe me? Go ask your, your grandmother. Hey grandma, you're an awesome Catholic man. Is the life of a Catholic a life of war? Where you been, man? Of course it is. I'm happy to get three days in a row of peaceful. That's, something's gonna happen by Tuesday. <laughs> Pull up my phone, okay, who's in trouble now? But guess what? We don't fight alone, do we? We never fight alone. So here's something then we have to absolutely keep in mind. Because our God, he wants to fight for us and with us when it comes to saving souls beginning with ourselves, we have to be able to fight with him. We have to be effective weapon in his hand, a weapon of love, of peace, of truth, of prayer. Because those are the weapons that conquer for our God. But we will never be effective in the battle if we don't realize something and then take care of it. Very important aspect of our lives. So going back one more time to the ancient Israelites, when it came to fighting, fighting wars, hand-to-hand -hand combat, right? Slaves did not have to fight. Slaves were not members of any army. They just did what they were told to do. And warfare was not something that many of them did. Slaves don't fight because slaves can't fight. A person who is free is the one who can fight because a free person is the one who has to be able to fight. So let's apply this then to ourselves. If we're living a life of sin, you're always being overcome by gossip, lust, greed, anger that's out of control, whatever it might be. 
Well, you're not free. You're a slave to that sin. It's pushing you around. And just like the ancient Egyptians told the Israelites what to do, so too your sinfulness tells you what to do. But how many of you right after falling into another sin that's a habit, habitual sin, it's like, man, what did I just do? I can't believe I did that. It's like I had no control. I just went right full speed into that temptation. Exactly. That's what being a slave to sin is all about. But our Lord Jesus Christ, you know what he's going to do for you all here today? He's going to set you free. Through the sacrament of confession, through the Holy Eucharist, through the Holy Spirit, through the power of prayer. We no longer have to be slaves to sin. We can be free. But once you become free, you have to fight. And there's no getting around that. We have to fight with our Lord Jesus on two fronts. First, we have to fight so that the graces given to us from God to help us become holy are not lost. The temptations, the devil and his demons throw at us to try to get us back to our old way of life, to go back to that life of slavery, will not overcome us. But second, we fight for the souls of others. We fight so that others may be victorious as well, so that others may enter into the salvation that our Lord Jesus is always working to give to us. So what gives us the power for the fight? It's prayer. That's a true source of our victory. But it must be a persevering prayer, a prayer that is filled with confidence, a prayer that will continue until the final victory is ours.